Hey everybody, Faraday here. Um, I'm going to be doing something a little different in this video. I have a lot of stuff going on, so I don't think I'm going to be able to do it all in one sitting, so I'm going to experiment with the pause button. Also, uh, towards the end, I'm going to want to lay out some tarot cards, and I'm too much of a klutz to move the camera in one swift, beautiful motion where the camera just glides down to the tarot view. And rather than have you put up with me dropping it or aiming at weird stuff, um, again, I'll, I'll make use of the pause button. and We'll see how that looks. I'll review it all before I send it. And if it's a little choppy, well, I'm kind of a slob that way anyway. I'm not particularly skillful or have the resources to do a lot of real professional editing or anything. But um, we'll see how it works. So what I wanted to do was about four videos on the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, um, which are extremely important in magic and in tarot. And a lot of that comes from through the Golden Dawn from the Hermetic Kabbalah. And I wanted to look at it as sort of as from the perspective that you get from Hermetic Kabbalah. I don't intend to use a lot of technical terms or religious terms. Um, I know a lot of people would be turned off by that. People who are already studying the Hermetic Kabbalah are already going to be aware of most of what I'm going to say anyway. Um, people who are not studying it may not be studying it because they're not interested in, you know, talking about Bria and Atzeluth and the Sephiroth and, and, and all that sort of stuff that that to somebody who isn't interested in it, 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 it just is like a big sign saying, don't go this way. Um, I love it myself. But I thought I would just kick out some of the ideas without attaching a lot of technical terms or religious terms to them. Um, because as I said, they, they, they're, they're so important to modern magic. Um, most modern magic makes thinks about the elements the way that the Hermetic Kabbalah describes them, um, whether they know it or not, and whether it's stated explicitly or not. And the tarot in particular uses these ideas quite a bit, um, particularly because so much of the late... 19th century and 20th century tarot is based on the Golden Dawn system of tarot. Um, so any decks that you see that have Golden Dawn in the title are going to be thinking this way. Uh, Rider Waite Smith is thinking this way. Uh, Crowley's, Crowley, the Crowley Harris deck is going to be thinking this way, the top deck. Um, he, he changed the Golden Dawn system around quite a bit for, for Thelema, but um, some of the basic ideas, uh, including the elements, were, were very strongly the same. Um, the only place you're not going to see some of these things, some of these ideas intact in tarot, is um, you know if it's completely and entirely its own system. I would think even a lot of those are deciding what they mean when they think about the elements in reaction to the Golden Dawn system, if not in acceptance of. Um, and I think it's pretty interesting. So today we're going to talk about fire. So one of the purposes of the Hermetic Kabbalah is an attempt to come to grips with the infinite. Um, and that's impossible. Um, you can't talk about it. You can't really think about it. I mean, you can try, but you're not going to get close to it because, um, by definition, the infinite is boundless. Um, yet, the word definition itself means to, you know, set limits to something, boundaries to something, so that you can understand it specifically. Um, this, whether the infinite be uh, present in the mundane or whether it be purely transcendental, I tend to think it's both. Um, 
means that as soon as you start trying to describe it or think about what it is or what it isn't, you're putting a limit on it, which means that you're not talking about the infinite, which is by definition limitless. Um, part of that is the way we think and perceive. We have a tendency to understand things based on their relationship to other things. Uh, I suppose if you wanted to get all Zen, you could say that that means you don't really know anything because really we just have a series of references, but if we don't understand all of these things that are being referred to either, then what do we know? Um, since you can't really compare the infinite to anything uh, without setting limitations, you can't think about the infinite the way we normally do. Think about other things. Um, so one of the methods that they try to get around this was by talking about what what's called the four worlds. And there are fancy names for them, but basically they're fire, water, air, and earth. And it's not meant to imply that there are actually four separate worlds. It's just four different ways of looking at the world that we're in, of looking at ourselves, of looking at the divine, of looking at the infinite. And again, it doesn't work because you're excluding something or adding something or saying something about it, and so immediately you're not talking about the infinite. Nonetheless, the, att the attempt is a f uh, to think about it as a form of meditation, and meditation can bring us to the infinite, so it's not a worthless endeavor. Furthermore, side effects coming out of it are, you know, the way we look at the elements in um, magic and in tarot, which hopefully most people watching this video realize are practically useful things, as well as techniques of meditation which can help us to expand our minds to get closer to the divine and the infinite. So the world of fire is sometimes called the archetypal world. And archetype is a big word that has a lot of meaning. It's a technical term in certain forms of psychology. Um, it has a common usage, particularly in the occult and magic, that isn't exactly the same as it is in psychology. Uh, the differences are nuanced. Um, people think of archetypal imagery in the tarot. Um, the word archetype and everything that it means in all of these different ways is probably worth a video of its own. And I would suggest that um, doing some research into what it means would not be time wasted. Um, in this is instance, it's sort of synonymous with the fact that the world of fire is considered the divine world, meaning it's the, it's the level of consciousness, the level of reality, the level of, of creation that is the gods or a transcendental god. It is not anthropomorphized, sort of a fairy tale, exoteric mythology, superhero type superhumans who look like us and think like us and emote like us and but have, you know, wings sandals with wings on them or um, magic hammers that are, are are the lightning. Um it's about non human larger than we understand enormous divine entities which are so much more than we are. Um, like uh, Hermes, for example, with the, the, the winged sandals and the, the hat. Um, he's a god of crossroads and of boundaries, of traveling, of communication, of thieves. Um, that's all kind of 
you know, comic books through the ages, straight down through the romantic mythologies of playwrights and, and, and uh, you know, romantic no notion writers of all sorts. Um, really, the way to think of it is as um, communication and interaction of any sort across all of reality. Wherever words are leaving one brain and entering another, wherever people are standing in the boundary from one place to another, carrying one thing from one place to another place, um, wherever there's interaction and interchange, whether that be commerce or sex or ideas, whenever there's an interchange, there is Hermes. Um, I did a video on talking to the storm, wherever there is that swirling, rushing interchange of, of different things moving together in a twirling motion and, and causing some sort of precipitation, there is Zeus. Um, they're big, they're huge, they're not human, they don't think the way we do, they don't feel the way we do. Their thoughts and their feelings are so much larger than ours, and in fact, their thoughts create the reality that we experience. So, when they say fire is the divine world, they mean that, that big divine existence that we try to interact with through various techniques, try to to become one with, try to talk to, try to be involved with, and all of that is possible, which is the miraculous, beautiful thing about magic and religion. And, um, but it's so much bigger than we think. It's so much bigger than our personalities, than our bodies, than our planet even. Um, bigger than our solar system, bigger than the universe. It's, it's, the, the divinity is huge. The gods are huge. And um, we see them through the filter of ourselves, but that's not the world of fire. Um, where the world of fire interacts with us is through will. The world of fire is willpower. It's, it's my will to accomplish something. It's your will to accomplish something. Um, it's the primary thing you want to look at if you're doing a tarot reading and, and the rods or the staffs or the wands, whatever you call them, comes up. That's, that's, that's some aspect of will. Um, will is so big that you need an entire suit of cards to, to deal with it. And, but in an individual, and that's in meditation, in an individual reading, the big question when you're doing your divination is, is it talking about my will? Is it talking about the will of somebody in my life? Is it talking about several people's wills? Um, are the wills conflicting? Are the wills united? Is it the will of the divine? And the will of the divine is the real secret power uh, behind magic and, and, and power in general. Um, divine will, whether that be the gods or a transcendental god or your own higher self or divine genius or, or holy guardian angel or whatever you want to call it, whatever you worship, whatever you adore, whatever you love, whatever is beyond you that you want to feel unity with, that you're already one with, but you just don't have the will to have accomplish the, the feeling of that yet. Um, that will, that divine will, is irresistible. Meaning that um, tuning in your own personality will, finding out what the wills of others is, is all very good and very important and very practical. Learning how to tune into that divine will, that divine fire, the fire of the gods, the fire that Prometheus gave to us, um, is to become irresistible because we are just the vehicle for that will. And that's, that's, that's the goal of magic, to become the vehicle of that divine fire because that divine fire creates reality. It, it, because that's what the divine does. Um, now the question is, how do you accomplish that? How do you tune into the will? 
how do you tune into the fire? Um, traditionally, there are a couple of ways, and those would be invocation and evocation. And there's as many different kinds of ways to do that as there are people out there practicing magic. Um, I didn't intend this video to be a lesson in those things, but anything that involves working with spirits can involve working with fire spirits or the elementals. There's an old belief that when you're in the presence of an elemental, you take on some of its qualities. So spending time with fire elementals is a part of a process of, of tuning in more to fire. And that sort of invocation or evocation be, can be as simple as lighting a candle and meditating on the flame. Um, really any spirit workers out there that you run across have ways that they deal with spirits and they will work with fire elementals as well. Um, witches who work in the circle and who call the quarters, um, the quarter that has to do with fire is, is then charged with that. It, it's a form of invocation when you create the circle and you can spend time in the fire quarter and commune with the fire. I myself uh, daily do something called the um, opening by watchtower, which is creating a circle and doing a lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which involves calling out to the archangel of fire, and in that quarter I can stop and, and commune with that archangel. Um, it then goes on to invoke fire as a force and evoke fire as well. And both of those can serve that purpose of communing with, with fire within and without. Um, but some of that can be kind of complex, and some of it requires certain skills, and um, those of you who already possess those skills uh, already know how to, to be in touch with the fire. Oh, and one thing else I should say about evocation is that um, if you're going to do a more, uh, a, a, like a real traditional sort of semi-Solomonic evocation uh, of a spirit, um, the one uh, one of the traditional elemental kings is it goes by the name of Dijin or Jin, which is D J I N N, and in some ways it's it's a misleading kind of name because it's actually the name of an entire category of, of spirits believed in by um, a lot of people, but it, it comes out of the Middle East um, and. Uh, paganism before Islam and, and even Islam itself talks about jinn. Um, but European ceremonial magic talks about several elemental kings and for some reason they, they, they named the fire uh, king jinn or de jinn. And um, he's actually, for somebody who's just getting to evocations, to big evocations, but isn't real experienced yet, uh, he's he's a good one to evoke because he's relatively friendly to humans so long as you treat him with the proper respect and he will teach you meditations for how to, to co-mingle with fire and commune with fire and um, spells for working with fire um, good evocation there um, but what I was going to say is that um, for those people who don't yet have a skill set where working that closely with spirits or uh, evocation and invocation are um, within the realm of safe possibility, yet another really good, simple, important, and useful, 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 practical um, technique for getting in touch with fire, the will, the divine of, of that fire world is um, meditation on 
tarot cards that have to do with fire. So, tarot cards to meditate on, to tune into the will, the divine, the archetypal world. Um, a magician who I've learned a lot from over the last year or so points out that sometimes it's easier to get tuned in if you look at the bigger picture rather than the more mundane picture because there's a degree of purity. It's easier to see a large thing than a small thing. Whereas the more mundane, um, that's an admixture of a lot of things. Like here on Earth, um, we don't see a lot of purely fire, elemental, mystical fire, magical fire. We see a mixture of, of different elements to a certain degree. But um, there's a scale of cards that we can look at. And I'm going to hit the screen share and pull up PowerPoint so I can show you cards. And hopefully that's working. I guess I'll see when I look back at the video. Um, let's see. Um, hit the slideshow button. So the first is the Ace of Wands. The Ace of Wands is pure elemental fire. It's the one thing, the transcendental unity, as it expresses through what fire. It is the world of fire. Um, so it's a real good one to start your meditating on. Um, the next layer would be the science of the zodiac associated with fire. That would be the emperor, which is Aries, strength, which is Leo, and temperance, which is Sagittarius. Uh, you can see that there's already beginning to be an admixture. There's some um, water running behind the emperor. In Rider Wait here, it's not quite as apparent as it is in some other decks, but it, you can see it if you look. And Temperance here, you see a lot of water. He's, the angel has his foot in water. Um, he's pouring water between the two cups. Although the waviness actually suggests energy. And in other decks, there are other decks where he's pouring a cup of water in one hand and the other hand he's got a, a fire brand. And um, he's pouring the water onto a lion, like the lion of strength, and the, the fire onto an eagle, which is a symbol of water. If you look at our guy here, he's got a fire triangle on his chest, and his face is Leonine, resembling the lion in strength. He's wearing a sun symbol on his forehead, which is evocative of, of fire. The sun is considered fiery. Um, this light shining on the mountain in the background in some decks is a volcanic eruption. There are some folks who talk about these as being one of them being terrestrial fire, one of them celestial fire, and one of them earthly fire. I'll leave it to your meditations and researches to make those discoveries. Um, Leo here, strength, is probably the purest. Um, when you're doing something like the, the opening by a watchtower, when you draw the fire pentagram, you generally trace the Leo symbol in it. So when you're using invocation and evocation to commune with fire, um, you're focused more on Leo than the other two. Um, 
Next down in the scale, we get the suit of wands, the entire suit. And there is more or less an admixture here. I mean, for the most part, it seems pretty fiery. If you look at the color schemes, it, it's more fiery than anything else. Although as you get towards the bottom, you're seeing more greens and earth tones, more flowers. Um, but even up as early as the two, you, you do see some water as well. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the admixture later, but all of these cards are really good for meditating on to try and get an idea of fire and to tune into fire. Uh, next on down, I wanted to talk a bit about the admixture. Like if you look at the Empress, uh, the Empress is the planet Venus, and Venus is considered a watery planet. Um, and you can see the fire and the plants. Um, and some of the designs, she's some cards I've seen, she's actually wearing a fire triangle similar to the, similar to the one that the angel in Temperance is wearing. And there's a suggestion, and she's also sitting in here, she's sitting on red, and you can see that uh, all these, these flowers are Venus symbols, but there's red in the heart. There's a suggestion there because Venus is lovers with, the goddess Venus is, is a lover of the goddess, Ma, or the god Mars, which is key 16, the tower. Um, and if you look at that one, you'll probably find some Venus references too. They never get too far from each other. Um, in the lover's card here, we see this tree with fire on it behind the man. Um, obviously, Adam and Eve, because of the serpent in the tree here, it's also fire in the angel's wings, and again, the predominance of the sun, which is, um, again, fiery. Um, the lover's is Gemini, which is an airy sign, and, and air and fire Air complements fire. Fire can't burn without air and air and air blown into a fire. Well, if it's blown too hard, it can blow it out. But if it's a strong enough fire, all adding air to fire does is make it burn brighter. Um, so, well, technically this isn't a fire card, big card because it's an air sign. You can see that fire plays a role in it. Judgment is a, is a strange special case. Um, that was my timer going off to tell me that it's just become the hour of Mars. So we are in a fiery hour now. That was unplanned, but it's kind of neat. Um, and actually, it, it's also the day of the moon as I'm recording this. So it's it's a fiery hour in a wat on a watery day. And um, judgment here fits into that as well. Um, in the Hermetic Kabbalah, all of the major arcana are attributed to, a, and in the Golden Dawn system, all of the major arcana are attributed to a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which has magical significance for use in their magic. And um, 12 are signs of the zodiac, seven are planets, and three are called the mother letters. Uh, some people attribute the mother letters to the outer planets that weren't known about to the ancients. Um, and judgment would be Pluto, which Pluto slash Hades is sort of a fiery mythology there. But um, the mother letters are the letters of fire, water, and air. And judgment is fire. Now those mountains look like they're made of ice and we got a lot of water here. The, the only real flame, I mean the cross on the flag is, is red and um, the angel's hair appears to be flaming. That wouldn't make you want to immediately just assume fire. It's so much more obviously water. What I'll say is that um, <clears throat> Pluto is an invisible planet and uh, judgment also being associated with spirit seems to be about an invisible fire. Um, 
the way Pluto is an invisible planet and the way Hades Pluto was an invisible god being always in the underworld. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, just to confuse things even more, we'll look at the kings finally. And the kings, it's all of the kings. All of the kings are technically associated with fire. And all of the court cards are actually associated with the specific elements. The, the kings are fire, the queens are water, the princes or knights are air, and the pages or princesses are earth. However, they're considered to be sort of the the fire or earth or air or what have you of something. So the king of wands is fire of fire. The king of cups is fire of water. The king of swords is fire of air. The king of pentacles is fire of earth. And, and the same ends up being true with the queens. The queen is, um, the, the queen of cups, for example, would be water of water and the Queen of Wands would be fire of water and so on. So there, there's, there's an admixture. And the same is, is true for the twos, the fours, and the sevens, all of which also uh, have a, a fire component with the two, four, and seven of wands being fire of fire. Um, if you're experienced and been practicing for a while and are in tune with with um, energies, you can feel the energies moving around and you're good at sorting out what energies they are. Um, there's no reason not to meditate your way through the deck and find these correspondences or explore these correspondences if you already know them or, or decide to research them. If you're just starting and um, you're looking to meditate on tuning in, I would say your best bet is to, to start with the ace and work on the major arcana and move on to the suit of wands as the suit of wands as, as you get more used to it. Um, so as, so as to, to, to let fire really stand out um, as you're beginning to tune into it. Um, how to meditate on them. Um, the simplest way is probably to put the card on the table in front of you and to just look at it and to try to clear your mind and to let whatever comes to you from the card come to you from the card. Um, that's, of course, very difficult. Anybody who has meditated for a while knows that it, it, it's difficult. All of these forms of meditation I'm going to talk about, there's three of them. All, all of them are going to require practice. Like with everything else in magic, practice makes perfect. Um, the other method would be to imagine that a card becomes a door, the size of a door. You open the door and you walk through and you imagine yourself in the card. In the card, you have a conversation with the characters in the card or you walk around and look around and move beyond like what you see of the card is what you see through the doorway. Once you move through, you can move around and see the rest of the landscape. Um, how much bigger or smaller is it? What other things are on the horizon? Does it connect to pictures from other cards? Um, the trick is that once you use the power of your imagination to enter the card and interact, um, you don't have your imagination dictate what you see or what a character says to you, you 
listen to what it has to say and let it put the words or the visuals into your imagination rather than you controlling the entire scenario. Um, this is, again, easier said than done and gets easier with practice. Um, one of the reasons why meditation in general for practitioners of magic is useful is so that you can learn to distinguish between your thoughts and imaginings and stuff that's actually flowing through your mind that, that you're not the origin of. Um, again, practice makes perfect. Uh, the same is true for the third method, which would be to back into the card and become the card. Maybe become the whole card, maybe become the central character in the card or some other piece of, or object or place or thing in the card. But as you look at the card for a, look at the card for a while, then close your eyes and use the power of your imagination to fill in the details of the card, particularly the details of yourself. And as you fill the details of yourself as a character or an object in the card, you feel them. Like if you were doing the emperor, for example, you would feel the armor as you imagine put it as you imagine it on you. You feel the weight of the orb in his hand and the, and the, the staff in his hand. Uh, hear the water moving behind you. Feel the hardness of the stone thrown. Um, feel the chill in the air because the, the card is set like in the mountains. Um, try to really get into it and imagine all that. And then once you've imagined it so completely that it feels real, again, you let go and see what occurs to you now that you're tuned in to the emperor or the central figure or, you know, the, the rod or whatever it is that you're imagining yourself to be. Um, and that's basically it. It sounds simple, and in practice it is pretty simple, but it's also fairly difficult because you've got, um, you'll have a tendency to try and force your imagination onto it. But um, I have found those to be simple and effective ways to tune into elemental fire, to the world of the archetypes, to the world as seen as the will of the gods, of the world as it is the power of the divine. And uh, one more thought on fire, and that's that... Um, Modern science gives us four states of matter, and that's uh, solid, liquid, gas, and energy. And those actually apply to the tarot suits and the, the four elements pretty good. Um, in this case, fire would be energy. Contemplating that fire is energy in the physical world, what does that mean? How does that tie into the archetypal, the divine, the will? And um, one other thing is that um, I've seen definitions, scientific de definitions of fire that call it a process of oxidization. When we breathe, the blood pumps to our lungs so that oxygen can get into our lungs. Um, there's iron in our blood that bonds with the oxygen, so the oxygen molecules are attached to the iron molecules which are in the blood, and the blood then takes the oxygen all over the body, and the oxygen molecules are given to every cell in the body, which means that there's a process of oxidiz oxidization going on in every cell in the body all the time, and if we think of the definition of fire as being a process of oxidization, then we are a fire. And with that, I will edit this video together and upload it, and I will see you again to talk about water. Take care now.